We have the dry aged fish guy himself, Lee Wei, here. Lee Wei started his journey into dry aging in 2000, the year 2000. He's been perfecting it ever since. He's ded dedicated his career to this, and he's the leader of the dry aged fish movement right now in, this, in the country and basically in the world. He's the only dry aged wholesale fish seller in the world right now. Um, at his shop, The Joint Seafood in Ventura, he has a 5,000 pound fish capacity and he has 36 dry agers. This guy is at the fish market six days a week at four in the morning. Welcome, Leeway. Thank you, Brad. So I'll, I'll, I'll correct you right there. Okay. I, I'm sleeping at four o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm never at the fish market anymore. Your bio says that on the Whova app. Oh, really? <laughs> Franz! <laughs> let's, let's start this off, because we have a lot of information to cover. Leeway, how did you get started on this journey, man? Well, um, you know, I grew up fishing. Uh, it was a big family hobby of mine, uh, me and my dad. So, you know, naturally, when you, when you get good at fishing, you catch a lot of fish, obviously, right? But then when you have all this fish, you have to kind of deal with it. So that essentially was all my data points growing up. Um, you know, having a lot of fish to work with, um, only working out of coolers, uh, you know, at home residentially. So essentially it was just a lot of fish that you catch, you don't want any of it to go to waste. Um, and then you kind of just figure out different methods, different T uh, you know, different hacks, uh, different ways of maintaining shelf life of fish. So I'll go into that a little bit later, but essentially everything here is um, my own mythology of how to preserve fish without having it to go into a freezer, which in my mind is a big black hole, right? It just goes in the freezer and you won't see it for months. Or maybe when you do, it comes out and it's never the same. Never the same. So, um, that's essentially you know, how I got started, you know, catching a lot of fish, um, working with it, knowing how the fish changes the, from the moment you catch it, you kill it, you spike it, you bleed it, you transport it on a bed of ice and getting it from the ocean to the table. Um, so that's the journey that I've been, been trying to dial in. For my, for my, my, Let's break my it down. Life. What is dry aging a fish? Do, is it similar at all to, to, to doing it with meat? Are you introducing any kind of um, mold like the meat dry aging? So let's define dry aging, right? Dry aged fish. This term sucks. Because anyone that doesn't understand what dry aged fish is, they don't want dry fish and they don't want aged fish, right? It, without any kind of knowledge behind what the craft is, the term dry aged fish sucks. So. What it really means is you're, you are prolonging the longevity of the protein in a dry environment without the introduction of any kind of preservative. That's the key. My method is without incorporating any kind of preservative. So aging fish has been around forever, right? Um, smoking fish, curing fish, brining fish, even freezing fish is a form of, of aging fish, right? So without having to change that protein structure of the fish, is my definition of dry aging. So whenever you incorporate salt, right, for example, you're curing or you're brining, um, traditionally salt, salt of fish has been around forever, you know, 200 years or more. But, you know, once you salt a piece of fish, you, you change the protein and it's no longer the same as if it was when it was fresh. Um, now you have limitations on what you can do with it. It, it may be only appropriate for, a certain, for certain recipes. Right. Um, the way I dry age fish is the fish is still um, in its fresh state and then the chefs can utilize it in whatever means they want. So are there certain species that are better or worse, certain, certain suppliers that you love? Um, and, and does it, depending on the species, does that define how long you're going to dry age it for? Right, so for fish, um, every species of fish is different, okay? Um, a lot of people just think of it as fish. But when I look at fish, I'm comparing 
branzino to tuna as if I'm comparing quail to beef, really. They're coming from different environments. They have completely different diets, right? Um, their sheer size, maturity, everything is different about, about different species of fish. So once you take a step back and look at every kind of fish as a different species, then you can kind of dial in and figure out different protocols and different routines to approach each species of fish. What are the best species that you dry age in your shop? So, you know, over the years, we figured out a few different species that's very, you know, um, pro-aging. You know, it's, it's, they, 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 they have higher success rates. Um, you know, fish usually with a high fat content like salmon ages really well. Um, but then again, all salmon is different. For example, right now at the joint, we use three different kinds of salmon. We have a steelhead salmon, a king salmon, and a Scottish salmon. If I were to dry age those three fish, which we do, we have three different protocols because they're from different regions of the world. Their, their, their skin is different, their scale, I call it scale anatomy, the, the size of the scale, the thickness of the scale, how that incorporates on the skin is all different. So um, you know, when it's different like that, when the physical anatomy of the fish is different, we apply a different protocol. What is the process, basically? You have a fish, you have a fresh fish, it comes in, what do you do with it? I mean, is the cleaning process any different than if you were just gonna you know, clean it and then portion it and serve it in a restaurant fresh? Like walk us through the process, the fish comes through the door, because you're not picking it up at the market. We right, so, so it starts with sourcing. It starts with sourcing, Brad. So you know, we source directly from all of our producers. I want to understand how the fish is being raised, I want to understand how the fish is being harvested, how it's being killed, how it's being chilled, how it's being transported. What is that logistical plan looking like? That way, when I receive a box of fish at my, at my loading dock, I, I know what to expect, right? I want full rigor. I want, you know, um, bright gills. I want bright eyes. I want this fish to be out of the water no less than 36 hours. So, you know, yeah, I could, I could wake up at four o'clock in the morning, but we already know most fish downtown, it's been there for more than 36 hours. I, I know some of them, so I know the suppliers and the fishermen, they know what you want. Yeah. You're, you're, you have a reputation of being extremely discerning, and my understanding, we're not gonna mention names, but there are certain <laughs> kinds of fish and suppliers that you, you won't take in. Maybe because they don't necessarily translate well to the dry aging too. That's probably They're great fish. It. They're great fish. Yeah. It's just my success is dependent on all these steps, starting from the point of sourcing. So right. back to what I was saying. It right. comes in the back door. Right. Does the cleaning process change? What happens? Like you get the fish, you clean it, you prepare it for the dry ager, right? Which is right, right. here. Right. What's, what's that process up until it gets into here? And then how long? I know it's dependent on what kind of fish, right. but walk us through that like process. So the cleaning process is very strenuous. Like my guys are back in there, we call it the fish pit. Everyone has a dish pit, right? We have a fish pit. So we have guys lined up and um, depending on how the fish is scaled, traditional scaler, or what we like to go, go with fish with big scales is sukibiki, where we cut the scales off but maintain a skin layer on there. So depending on how the fish, what kind of fish it is, we, we scale it differently. Uh, we gut everything uh, immediately. And when we gut everything, we have to make sure that we, we, we clean the cavity very, very well. My guys are going in there with toothbrushes, right? Um, the bloodline, the kidney, um, whatever stomach acid that may be around when you puncture the stomach lining of the fish. You know, the purpose of Stomach acid is a decompose. That's its function. So if there's any traces of, of stomach acid anywhere, you're gonna lead to fail, it's gonna lead to failure. It's gonna start decomposing from the stomach cavity and it starts spreading, all right? So these are all the little things that we watch out for. And you know, um, I, I hear this a lot. Oh, are you cleaning the fish with water? Hell yes, hell yes. Water is the number one 
um, it, it's your, water is your frenemy, right? You have to know when to use water, okay? Um, during the cleaning process, we use water. Once the fish is out of that cleaning process, it, it never touches water again, all right? Once it's in this dry form like this, it never touches water. Um, so water is your frenemy. You have to know when to use it and how to use it, all right? So once it's cleaned very well, we prep it, we hang it, and then now it sits in dry agers, and um, I like to call it conditions, right? It, it's sitting in different conditions. The ideal condition, and this is, and take this for a grain of salt, is gonna be as cold as you can make your fridge without anything freezing, okay? We run it at 0 0.8 degrees Celsius. That's how, that's how precise we wanna keep it. Most refrigeration, if you were ever to log temperature graphs out of refrigeration, you're gonna see it go up and down, up and down. It's constantly moving. It's constantly getting warmer, it's constantly getting, and then getting colder, right, as the compressor runs. So what you want is a flatline average that is as stable as possible and as low as possible, right? That's gonna maintain integrity of your protein as it rests, as it rests. Humidity, it really depends. Um, and when I say it really depends, is it depends on the type of fish and your ambient humidity. So, you know, I'm blessed to be in LA where it's desert and we're dry, so it helps us. But if you're in Florida and you're trying to dry each fish, you're gonna be constantly battle, battling that humidity, right? So you wanna be around 80, 85%. Okay, why don't you tell everybody what is being passed around and then I wanna ask, so what condition, first of all, you have been involved working closely with this company, this dry aging cabinet company, right? Right. On getting it, getting, getting these optimized for dry aging a fish, right? Right. So tell us about what conditions, there's humidity being controlled, temperature, what other conditions in that box are you able to control? So dry ager was originally designed for beef by some German engineers. Um, and when I started working with them, uh, the first unit they sent me, it was dialed in for beef. I put in fish and it was a disaster, right? Beef aging is, is a higher temperature. Um, it, every, it, it just did not work, right? So, but because it's very, very digital, we're able to dial in and change all the parameters, how the compressor is working with the fan, how the defrost working, how the defrost cycles are working with the fan, with the heater, when is it, you know, pulling moisture, when is it putting back moisture? So once you have that dialed in, then now they're, they're starting to work for fish, you know? Um, you know, dry aging fish, you know, I've been doing it. The first fish I ever aged was, was a uh, big eye tuna, about 120 pounds. And I had it in a cooler with crushed ice, propped up 45 degrees against the tree, draining on the bottom. And that was what I was doing for five days. Right, that was the first fish I ever, you know, aged when I was 12. I, I remember it very clearly. You're how old? 12. 12 years old. And, you know, essentially, these are the different, like, motives you want in aging fish. It, the, why do we want to dry age fish? It's not to follow a trend. It's to focus on what we want to do to this fish, how do we want to change it to make it better, right? So if you focus on that and maintenance, you're always going to have a better product at the end, even if you're dry aging or not. That's a perfect transition. What are we, what are we trying now? You guys are trying um, Aura King Salmon from New Zealand, and these guys are just at about a 12 day age. 12 what? 12 day. 12 day. 12 okay. day. So question on, now we're gonna talk about flavor, texture, right? So I, I have a question. Let's say we had a chef, he's here, Michael Rossi, as an example. Michael Rossi is gonna take a piece of or a king salmon that's as fresh as possible that just came in, and he's gonna take one of your beautifully dry-aged sides of salmon, and he's gonna basically make the same exact dish, the fresh here, the or king, uh, the dry-aged right here, prepared the same way, same preparation. Someone comes and tastes them, right? What, what are the flavor differences that they should be tasting the texture differences and any other differences. At the end of the day, what's the difference? So I'll show you as I'm working through this fish uh, what I'm looking for when I, when I condition a fish. Um, first off, if you notice my cutting board, as I'm working through these cuts, 
it's going to be, the first thing is a lack of blood. Blood is the biggest culprit in making fish go bad or making fish fishy, right? Um, one of the, the missions that we do when we hang a fish vertical is to extract a lot of this blood. Um, you, may, you may not notice this, but next time you, you're filleting a piece of fresh fish, just see how much blood is on that piece of fillet or even on the rack, on the bone. Um, when I cut this tail like this, you're going to notice that there is still a little bit of blood in there, but if I were to chop this tail off of a fresh aura, it's going to have blood everywhere, blood everywhere. So that, that, that first mission was accomplished, the, the, the purging of impurities, impurities that are blood, slime, water, all these are going to contribute to that fishy taste. It's all going to contribute to um, a shortened shelf life. It's going to make your product spoil faster. So at the end of the day, blood is the biggest culprit. So regarding flavor, we're looking at le a milder, less fishy flavor. Correct. Okay. Any other differences in flavor? It's going to, you know, I call it clarity. So now once you've removed that impurity and then you're, you're tasting fish for what it should really taste like, then everything's bright. You're going to be able to get all those, all those notes. It's sweetness, um, or King Thais. I have salmon tasting like mangoes and lychee. And you never even realized what's there if it was being muddied by that fishiness. Right, right? Okay. So, so basically, ideally, you're taking away some of the fishy f flavor that is going to potentially blind the true flavor of that fish. Correct, correct. So that's one of our biggest um, reasons to age fish, right? We want to clean it up, purge the impurities, uh, make it a little bit more shelf stable, and then from there you have a better product, right? How about texture-wise, specifically to texture with the finished product? So specific to texture, um, what we've done, and I'll go back to actually talk about um, weight loss, like shrinkage. So, and that has everything to do with texture. So a lot of times you hear in beef, um, oh, it's lost 20% weight or 15% weight, right? And that's, that's essentially the moisture content that's being either dripped off, evaporated, whatever it may be. And then now when, it, when that moisture is excreted, um, the protein structure gets more dense, right? And then when things get denser, um, it, you have a sense of um, uh, tenderness. It's almost a little, it's more, it's tighter, it's more tender, um, and that's what translates to the, the, the mouth feel. Um, the, the best way I like to explain how this dry age fish feel when you're, you're eating it is it is definitely more um, tender without the mushiness. Yeah. So when it's mushy, then that means that it's, it's, go, it's gone down that road of decomposition, right? And you don't want that, right? So you want things dense, you want things tight. Now, is it dry? It's not dry because all we've lost is water and blood. The fats are still there. So in your mind, when you eat it, it's actually going to be juicier because the fat to lean ratio is now higher. On the, on the taste that I just took, the, the fat comes through differently on that taste that I just had versus right. a non-dry dry age. I could really taste the fat, like, like cl clarity, like you said, almost. Yeah, so that's what we try to accomplish. Um, you know, it, for me, in-house, in we, we talk about dry aging, but we all talk, about, we, we just talk about conditioning. Like, we have different, you know, protocols that we want to achieve, like different missions we want to achieve, right? We want to purge your blood, tighten up the flesh, and then we stop thinking in days. A lot of people like to start thinking in days, but it, the days are irrelevant. Days are, days, are, you know, I like to use interstellar music because it's all relative, right? Um, like five days is different for one fish than it is for another fish. So we stop using days. We, if, if anything, if you want to do this at home or in your, in your restaurant, I, I think you should use um, percentage of weight loss. So getting started, you know, do, do use fish you can source locally as best as possible, right? And then from there, you take your own data, make your own data. Um, weigh a fish before you start hanging it, 
and then taste test it as you go. At five days, 10 days, 15 days, note the, the reduction in weight, and then note the flavor profile. Find that perfect window of opportunity to use the fish. Are you suggesting like the chefs try this out in their walk-in at the restaurant and do it that way, or are you talking about get, get a dry agent? Th there's limitations to doing this just in your walk-in because your conditions are unstable, right? Uh, we talk about the environment that it really needs in to prolong and not have the product spoil, um, but it's a start. It's a start. I guarantee you putting a fish in a walk-in vertically is going to be better than putting it on, on in, you know, in a camera with ice. It's going to be definitely be better. Okay, so that's the Aura King Salmon. Um, I don't know if you guys want to get a close-up of this, um, but if you can see, when I cut this fish, it maintains a lot of that structure on that fish, right? Um, we, we like to cut without, having going, without pushing the knife across the spine and having a flat cut. Remember, a fish is round, right? If you take a flat cut and then you lay it on its skin, you're stretching the cut side and it'll break. So we always try to take the fillet off in according, according to the anatomy of the fish. And then from here, you can see how this is tighter. It's denser, all right? It's dense, you can see this curvature here. On fresh fish, you wouldn't get these tight lines, these tight lines. Now you're moving into a different, is this the Branzino or the Cod? Yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll move to Branzino to um, demonstrate blood on a fish. So this is a Spanish Branzino. Um, and because it's white fleshed, we will be able to see what I'm talking about when I say we are working with uh, removing the blood. Okay, so here we have a white, white fleshed fish where on the spine, you have a lack of blood. You know, people don't realize this, but a, 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 a fish is just like other mammals where it's got a lot of microcapillaries of ves blood vessels. And if you were to ever do this with a fresh piece of white flesh meat fish, you'll see that even when it looks white and you wipe it with a white paper towel, you're gonna to get blood on your, on, your, on your paper towel. So even though you don't see it, you're tasting it. So that's what's, that's what's you know, blocking your, your, your flavors, right? So that's what we want. That's what we and want. the blood makes it, having more blood in there makes it spoil Fishier. faster too. Exactly, exactly. So. It looks very firm. Yes, it's got, it's denser, right? It's yeah. cold, it's a pretty fatty fish. So um, it's gonna give you that very tight, tight appeal. We're gonna sample this guy out here too, as well. So you're gonna get some Aura King getting passed around, you have, have um, you're gonna have Branzinos passed around as well. And this one's been aged how long? This is also about nine days. What's the longest any fish would be dry aged? I mean, we can make fish not spoil for up to 60, 90 days, you know, but not, you know, having it not spoil isn't really the objective, right? And we really want to just make optimize. fish optimize. Right? When, when is the perfect opportunity to eat the fish, right? When, when, is it, when is it tastiest, right? It's not about how long or how old we can make it. Do you do small fish, like little mackerels or little, little baby fish? So that goes to saying, um, are all fish able, are you able to dry age all fish? So now that's, it's all relative, right? So it's to scale. When we, I age sardines as well. If you ever take a fresh sardine that's still, you know, and then try to debone that, that it's not gonna debone. So I actually like to, kill my sardines, 
get them resting in the right environment and then get to it after 24 hours, right? So that one day for a sardine is equivalent to maybe like six or seven day on a branzino, right? A lot of that, you know, protein structure starts breaking down, the connective tissue between the skin and the flesh. It all starts breaking down a little bit, relaxing a little bit, coming out of rigor mortis. As things come out of rigor mortis, it's, it's signaling protein to start decomposing. But if you preserve and have the right conditions, it's not going to decompose. So the next fish I want to show you guys is a black cod. Who's worked with black cod before here? How soft are they? Do they look like this? Right? It's planking. And this one, how long? This one is about, um, everything I brought this today, you know, they're all relative in the same size. This is right around 10 days, it's right around 10 days. So does size matter as the, as the main um, determinant of, of length, or is uh, it everything? Does size, it like fat content, fat content um, and then, you know, for us at Joint Seafood, we bring things to a certain spec. We like to call it spec because it's our spec of fish. And um, we see a window where anytime we send a fish to a restaurant, they're going to expect it to be relatively the same within that window of spec, right? So we'll send, we'll send black cod at 7 to 14 days. Whether they get it on day 9 or day 14, it's always going to be the same. Because once it gets to that spec, it's, it's going to be relatively stable for the next range, whatever it may be. You know, some fish have a smaller window, some fish have a bigger window. Um, so it really depends on the fish, like bluefin tuna. You know, Spanish bluefin tuna or Baja bluefin from Bluefina, we probably age that stuff in loins for 18 to 21 days before we even cut into it. Um, tuna, actually, spiel tuna is probably one of the hardest fish to age because every single fish is different. Every single fish is different. Me and Josh here, we, every time we get a fish in, we're grading it, we're watching it, we're assessing it, we're checking it. Day four, day seven, day nine, uh, like, you know, it, whatever it may be, we're, we're looking at it because uh, it's such a large animal. It's a high hemoglobin animal, um, high heat, um, large, harvest is, you know, it's, it's difficult harvesting the fish because of its sheer size. Um, so everything plays a part for, for a large fish like, like tuna. Um, it could be harvested, the per like, for example, it could be, you know, harvested the perfect way, but... It, it didn't get cooled down fast enough. And that's going to affect the way it ages, right? So that's why we like to understand um, everything that happens to a fish before it even arrives at our door. How do you portion a very large fish, like a tuna or maybe a massive swordfish, to prepare it for the dry ager? Like what sizes or chunks? Or so we like to try to keep things as big as possible. With, with you know, fish under 40, 50 pounds, we keep them whole. Okay, for tuna, um, we work with five, six hundred pounders. So, you know, hanging it vertically is it's not practical. It's not practical. Um, maybe a hundred and fifty pounder, if you get it vertical, it'll, it'll age. But the sheer mass of the fish, you're just not letting enough of it out. Uh, it starts encasing itself, and it's gonna start spoiling before you even get to a good point, right? So for, for tuna, we like to age them in primals, we would call them, like, you know, as, as big as possible, um, bottom loin, top loin, and then we go from there. We create a pellicle like we do for beef because it's a high hemoglobin animal. And from there, depending on how that pellicle is created, then we can tell if the fish is going to be good or not, depending on how many days it is. That's Did a everybody try top the level salmon? question. <laughs> Did everybody try the salmon? Yes, everybody. No. No. Okay. Back there, back there. When they come down, maybe raise your hand. So, Leeway, let's say a chef has had your fish wholesale, loves it. 
What would you suggest in terms of them getting into the dry aging game on their own? Should they think about it? Does it depend on the operation of the restaurant? The, you know, where should they even start? It depends on what they want, really. Um, you know, I always urge them to, to think about what are your reasons to dry age fish, right? Do you have the ability to do so? Like, yes, you can hang it in your walk-in and you can do only so much. Right? But maybe that might be good enough for some chefs. Right? Hang it in your walk-in and if you use it over three days, yeah, you're getting a, you know, a significant amount of, of blood out. You're, you're, you're getting a significant amount of you know, a slime out off of that fish. And it's going to be that much better. But are you able to get to the next level in your walk-in? The answer is no. So it really depends on what you want as a chef. But I think if you just think about your whys and you put in you know, the different you know, like efforts to do what you want, then you know, I created a dry age fish program not wanting to create dry age fish. It's all about how I want to prolong shelf life and get a better product. Right. Um, so what kind of financial investment are we talking about for a dry ager? What's the range? Um, dry agers are quite expensive. Um, get them when they are on sale. Um, <laughs> uh, the, you know, I think these units range anywhere in the eight to ten k range, and I think that eight k. I I think okay. I think, um, but you know, like one dry ager like this will probably is probably good for a restaurant that does two hundred and fifty covers a night, because you at at the end of the day, you know, you're not using that much fish. You know, you're you you have maybe six fish on rotation, meaning twelve all day. So you're rotating through it and, you know, yeah. working through that rotation. And your operation, who do you wholesale to? Um, all California, all, you know, throughout the U.S.? Uh, we sell some to, of your clients? We vet, we vet all of our clients, and we sell all around the U.S. So, you know, as far as, as Washington, D.C., as far as Florida, Tennessee, San Francisco, you know, um, we, you know, there's nothing we can't get to with FedEx. So, do you, are there some chefs that you work hand in hand with developing something special for them for their menus? Definitely. Um, like I said, it depends on what the chefs want, right? Why? What is their reason behind uh, having a program like this in house? And I've set chefs up where they've started buying fish from me, but then after a while, you know, because they are not in LA, you know, we we work with them and and see what their sourcing is like locally, and then from there develop an in-house fish program, dry age fish program, you know, go from there. Are there any chefs or restaurants that you can share that you develop a specific product that basically as a consumer, you can only go to that restaurant to get this type of fish that's been dry aged by you? Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely restaurants that use fit my, my fish all around town. Um, but, you know, some sushi bars like Brother Sushi, Wooden Hills, Santa Monica, they have in-house programs uh, that's dry aging fish, but, you know, they buy the fish from me fresh. And then from there, they, they leverage my, my sourcing for their own in-house programs. But not everyone's like that. Most, most people are, are getting a, a, a started product or a finished product. Should we move to questions? Uh, yeah, let's go to questions. Jackie? Jackie Lianza, <laughs> um, I think you have some questions from the app first. Yes, so we'll Huba. go through those. And I think we've talked about some of them already. Um, and Leeway, I know that we've talked about, you know, how do you know how long to age each species of fish? Right. It sounds like it start, starts from sourcing and knowing where the fish came from and also just a lot of testing and measuring and tasting. Anything else that you do to determine how long to age a fish? Um... It's a, it's a process, right? And then it's, it's a discipline, almost. Um, you know, every batch of fish that comes in you through your door, you have to keep an eye on it. It's, just, it's not because last time this was good at five days, this time it's going to be good at five days. Like, you have to, you know, expect that it, there are different variables in logistics. Things could happen, you know. There could be flight delays. There could be temperature breaks. Uh, temperature is the biggest is the most important thing, right? Um, for example, if a fish has a layover somewhere, misses a flight, and it's out of temp for even two hours, 
and they bring it back down to temp, that two hours out of temp has already started a chain, act, chain reaction that is going to be affected in the long term. So these are all things to really think about. And here's a, another question from the app. Is it true that fattier fish can be aged for a much longer period of time? Yes and no. Um, fattier fish has a lower water ratio. So yes, just from that sheer fact of having a higher fat percentage, you're not going to dry out the fish too soon. Um, like, for example, New Zealand, wild New Zealand sea bream, Thai snapper, uh, those are relatively lean. Um, those will dry out beyond 25% very quickly because of a lack of fat, right? So, so for each kind of fish, you kind of want to dial in and, you know, figure out what is your ideal percentage weight loss, right? Moisture reduction. Uh, and then from there, you can figure out what you like the best for your menu, for your dish. What about yield? How does dry aging impact yield? So um, for us, we think of yield as in, in, in product that you are unable to use, right? Um, we, I like to say that we have 100% yield. Because, for example, this king salmon here, you know, uh, it might weigh 20% uh, less than it was when it was fresh. However, you would have yielded the same 15 portions before and after. So on your plate, it might weigh less, but your square footage is still the same. So your portion size is still the same, right? So you're not losing any yield in that sense. Tuna is tricky. Yes, you have yield issues there. You might have to cut off a lot on that pellicle. But if you do a really good job, your pellicle is very, very thin and very little loss there. I just want to say the level of precision over here, you guys, uh, it's fucking magical, this guy. It really is. It really is. We should get, we should get a little bit of this, I think, because this guy... Are there any fish that, are, um, that would be too rich in flavor or too strong in flavor after being dry aged? Is the flavor there to begin with? That's the thing, all right? Um, I, I don't think I've ever tasted a fish when it was in its freshest state to be too strong in flavor. The, the strong flavor in this that you may be getting might have been a cause for um, blood or impurities that were there that, that made the fish fishy beforehand. Mm. So, you know, the reason why we do this process is to purge those impurities and clean up those flavors so that you're not getting a muddy taste. So. Is it true that fattier fish can be dry aged for a longer period of time? Uh, yes, because of the higher fat content, you won't lose as much weight but um, some fatty fish can't go for that long. Um, a perfect example is Scottish salmon. You know, um, king salmon can go way longer than Scottish salmon. Um, so it's different species, different. It, it has to do everything to do with their diet as well. Diet, how, how cold the water is, the kind of fat it is. Yeah. Now, obviously, now we have this beautiful dry ager, but how have methods or techniques changed over the years? modern dry aging versus traditional? So, um, you know, it's the digital age. We're able to control everything that happens in the fridge. So um, I, I think as technology advances, we'll be able to do, you know, more and more crazy things without having to incorporate a preservative. You know, uh, we're already working on the second generation of dry agers that, that could tell apart species. You know, so it's, it, it, there's a lot happening because of the, you know, advances in technology. When is the Li Wei Liao dry ager coming out? That's, that, that maybe soon, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On to the next Available question. for pre-order, yeah. yeah, outside. Questions, yes sir. Well, what kind of consumers? Are we talking about the, the restaurant um, uh, consumers or rest restaurants being my consumer? Well, because you sell it directly to restaurants. 
Right. Well, it depends on the restaurant. Um, you know, some restaurants really like stability, and that's why they like working with us because we can prompt. We can, you know, a big part of what we do with them is inventory management, right? So, on rotation, for example, restaurant ABC, they use 200 Branzinos per week, right? Um, they don't want to have to think about missing a beat when it comes to Branzino. They always want it the same every time it comes in, every time they cook with it, work with it. Um, so on a restaurant like that, they, you know, they, they want Branzinos, um, and we'll, we'll rotate between 300 for them, you know? So some restaurants like that, that's, they want consistency. They, they never want their menu to change, right? Regardless of weather, regardless of logistical, you know, um, you know, struggles or whatever it may be. But then there's restaurants that's more so a, I have chefs that are, are, are tasting menu oriented where they want a different fish every week, right? Um, they want the, the v variety, they mix it up. You know, I'm on the phone with them every two weeks and then and we're planning three weeks out, you know? What do we have working now for them in two weeks? So it really depends on the chef and the kind of restaurant and, and the kind of menu that you have. We have, lots, we have lots of questions coming in in the app, but I see that we have questions in the audience. So should we move to some audience Up to you. Questions? Yeah, yeah, we and can. Uh, first of all, thank you to you and your staff for being here today. Um, do you guys do any other further processing for your restaurant customers? Or do you do any like value added items, anything cured or sausages or anything like that? Or So uh, no, um, not sausages, not, not like a value added product. But what, what we like to do is, um, or I should say, everything we do is a value add, right? So um, the, the reason why we differentiate ourselves with other wholesalers is we, we process the fish, we manage your fish inventory, and then depending on the restaurant, we also break it down for you a certain way, right? Um, restaurant ABC that uses 200 Branzinos. Now that labor is 20 plus an hour, they may not have the skill set or the labor to be able to butterfly 200 Branzinos a week, right? If I send them 200 Branzinos that's butterflied, they yield 200 Branzinos that's butterflied. If they were to order 200 Branzinos and do it in-house, they, right, right off the top, they might only be able to yield 190, that's 5% loss, right? So... How about when you're cleaning the fish? Any uh, particular type of water that you use? Someone asked about ozone water. Yes, so um, ozone water is very good. Uh, we use ozone water. However, not everybody has ozone water. or uh, We use ozone in our process as well as a way of um, keeping things safe. Um, but tap water, man. Tap water is your, is your cold tap water is your is your best friend because it has traces of chlorine and that itself is a disinfectant. So it's going to disinfect the outside of the fish that potentially may have listeria, right? So if anyone says don't clean fish with water, man, they're, they're gambling a lot there. You know, we, we clean our fish with water inside and out. Um, and then from there, that point on, we dry it. Water never touches the open flesh like this. It never touches, you know, water. However, in the stomach cavity, Again, stomach acid. Function of stomach acid is decomposed. You can't just wipe that away. You really have to rinse that off, make sure the cavity is clean, and then from there, you'll have uh, a, a better chance of success. Mm -hmm. Great. And what about the bones? Are you still able to use the bones in fish stock? And if so, does it give it a different flavor? Oh, it gives it a very clean flavor. Uh, you have no more blood protein in that bone, in that bone rack. So, you know, I have a hand roll bar where we utilize all of our bones for fish stock, um, when we have a one-to-one -one ratio of bones to water and we boil that down, we have no foam on top. That's how clean the bones are. Very, very clean. So now, if you don't, if you don't have that, you know, if it's clean like that, you're able to you know, really reduce that bone and head and everything and get all the marrow, all the collagen, all, all the gelatin out into the stock and make it rich. And what about once the fish is dry aged? How long can you serve it after? Can it be freezed? Um, so, you know, dry-aged fish is, it's got less water molecules 
in a protein structure, so it actually freezes very well. Um, we have restaurants that, that, you know, if they don't use this week's par up, they'll freeze it, sandbag it for, for that rainy day. And every time I hear when they defrost that fish, they're like, it's like it's fresh. Because uh, it, there's no water molecule expand and blow up, the mo blow up the protein, and it's no longer mushy. So it's almost like it's a fresh product. All right. Um, so yes, you can freeze dry aged fish. And your working shelf life is also higher in dry aged fish because you don't have the impurities on there that makes it spoil faster. Great. What another audience question? Anyone right here? Yeah, any special tips on or tips for chef on handling fish once it's filleted and you know you, you cut into a, the whole salmon and you serve half of it in a night or two. What, what should you be doing with it in between to you know take it off the line, put it back in the walk? And I know like with dry aged meat. You don't want to wrap it tight in plastic and that sort of thing. Is there anything with the dry aged fish that chefs should know? Uh, right. So you don't want, you never want to suffocate it, right? Um, understanding dew points is very important. Dew point is when water becomes a, uh, you know, moisture, humidity becomes water, right? So if you were to, if this piece of fish here is a little bit warmer and then you put it in a Lexan and you seal it up, and you throw it in your walk-in, it cools down, what's gonna happen? You're gonna produce more water out of that space because it's of the temperature delta, right? And that water is gonna go back onto the fish, and that's not what you want. So what I would suggest with, with slabs of salmon that's open like this is to put some kind of, of wicking material on there, whether it's butcher paper or, or tuna paper, paper towel is a good one, um, and wrap that in, in butcher paper so it breeds but yet protects at the same time. Um, our, our restaurants like to store their fish on speed racks, you know, on, on trays, so that you get even airflow throughout the whole rack, and you don't have a stack of fish. If we stack fish, you're going to have a te temperature delta, and that's going to create more moisture. All right, so um, just keeping moisture away will, will, will help a lot. And um, Leeway, once you're ready to prepare the fish, cook the fish, are there any methods that work better on dry aged fish, any to avoid? Um, like I said, with dry aged fish, you know, my objective is to keep it, at, you know, as neutral as possible. So it's good for any kind of, you know, preparation. It's really good on the grill, uh, open fire, you get the hot ambers. Um, like Barramundi, um, we dry aged that one. It's got a very, very thick skin that is almost like a pork skin. And when you get that on a hot amber that's 900 degrees, it puffs and pops like chicharron. Mm -hmm. So now you have that different, you know, texture layer uh, on, your, on your presentation. And someone was curious if you've ever dry aged a sturgeon. Sturgeon, yes. So very gamey. Um, and the, the, the thing with sturgeon is I can never seem to get sturgeon that's fresh enough. So um, it, it would be a good one. All fish benefit from, from some sort of conditioning. So um, if I were to have the demand for sturgeon, I would be able to condition and age sturgeon. Hi, Lee Wei. Hello. Um, are you using uh, wild caught fish exclusively? And if not, what's your opinion on fish farms? So a lot of the f producers that we work with are aquacultured. And that's because uh, for a lot of the restaurants that we work with, they want that consistency, right? Wild fish is very, very good, but it's not as consistent as some restaurants would need it to be. Um, so I would say 80% of the fish that we work with are aquacultured and 20% are wild. 20% are wild. Are there any specific brands that you recommend that you really like working with? I mean, the, you know, I, I always like to understand the producers, how they're raising the fish. Um, you know, so, you know, we work with Aura King, New Zealand King Salmon Company, um, Forever Oceans for Amberjack, um, Killick from Turkey for all their Branzinos and Sea Bream, um, Gindar for the Black Cod. So, I mean, it depends on the producers, right? Understanding the producers and understanding how the farm is raising their fish, you know, um, you, you can tell a lot from, from looking at the fish and tasting it. We taste our fish on a daily basis, batch basis. So, you know, I can tell when, they, when, they, when the farm changes their feed on me. 
you know, because it'll, it'll, you know, what they eat is what they, they will reflect in flavor. So, and that goes for wild fish as well. Um, you know, like bluefin tuna that's caught right here off of Catalina is going to taste different than ones off of the Tanner Bank because they're eating squid out there, right? So it's going to be different. The, the fish is going to reflect their diet. Hi. Going back to the question about um, shelf life and freezing fish, etc. Are you suggesting then not to backpack a fish if you're freezing, say, the leftovers or remains of half a fish before you freeze it? So aside from having to comply with HACCP, <laughs> um, vacuum packing is compression. You never really want to backpack fish because the pressures you put on the flesh, you're drawing out whatever may be good in the fish, right? That's why backpack fish is, always looks watery around there, right? So I, I never, I, I always suggest backpacking being the last resort. Um, but when you do do it, you, you know, there, there is a place in time. But generally, when you backpack a piece of fish, the compression on the fish is not good for it. So it draws out a lot of the water, and, the, and that's why, you know, frozen fish is always, tends to be a little bit drier, right? So it's the water content that, you know, blows up the protein, and then under vac pack, it all comes out, and then when you cook it, it gets dry. Yes? Thank you, Libe. Uh, can you tell us some about the applications in uh, sushi restaurants? Uh, how is the experience so far? Is it getting more popular, or traditional sushi restaurants versus new modern sushi restaurants? Thank you. Right, so, you know, Japan has been the f leaders in anything fish, right? Um, sushi chefs have been aging fish for hundreds of years, if not 200 years, right? Um, they, you know, they had to deal with it. So, you know, J Japanese culture and cuisine has a lot of methods of aging fish, whether it could be aged in you know, kombu or, or shoyu, like kiri, but it's all, there's a lot of different things they do to preserve the fish, right? I think they weren't really able to do what I do now, it was just kind of like dry aging because it wasn't possible back then with the refrigeration that they have. Um, but, you know, they would age fillets. They understood that wicking moisture away from the fillet is critical and it benefits them. And so every sushi chef kind of has their own little methods on different fish. So that's, that's what I've noticed. And I like talking with them, understanding what they want, what they're trying to achieve, the why, right? Why, why are they doing this? What are they trying to achieve? And are we able to do that in a different way? And Lee Wei, we're to your left over here. Thanks, Lee Wei, great pre presentation. Um, question about inventory management. Uh, you obviously have customers who buy one-offs, and then you have the ABC customer that you, mis that you mentioned uh, with 200 fish per week. Uh, well, is it on them to pre-order? Are you, you know, are, are you managing their inventory for them? Because we all have those rainy day moments where our pars drop like crazy. Um, is it on the customer to keep on ordering that product? Uh, and how, how do you manage that for them? So um, it's um, record keeping. Uh, it's data logging, right? So um, we keep track of their run rate, right? And then from their run rate, we produce a forecast. So this is the forecast that I tell my producers two weeks in advance, so they know how much to harvest for me, right? And then from there, you have a baseline of how much fish you have to, you, you, you need to bring in. And yes, of course, you're gonna always have rainy days where your pars are, are dropped and cancellate, you know, you have, you know, uh, cancellations or whatever, business is down this weekend. So that's perfect, it's fine, because at the end of the day, my fish is shelf stable at my facility, right? And I can just adjust my inventory on the back and load in less and I can push out whatever inventory I have now. Because remember, my Branzino is good at four days and it's also good at 12 days. It's exactly the same, right? So I have that one week leeway to kind of work with that inventory, right? We're actually a, um, a fish market ha that has zero loss. We have zero loss on fish. We have a question over here. Hi. Um, as someone who works with HACCP coordination, are there any factors that are different through this process rather than like a traditional storing method? 
traditional. Like like keeping fish on ice or something versus this process. Are there any factors that you have to consider to be uh, compliant with HACCP? So um, it's a tricky question. It's a loaded question. Um, for us, we try to comply with, you know, every producer that comes to us, we, we ask, what is the HACCP days that this fish is allowed to be in, in cold chain, right? And we actually stay within those terms, within those days, right? So then that's exactly why I say we like to work with our producers and understand logistics because this fish may be good in, in cold chain for 14 to 18 days, but I'm starting the process at day two. So I'm giving myself that, that runway, right? So, um, but there are some other, other things that we really try to not do, like the use of sanitizers. The, the purpose of sanitizers is to clean and decompose. <laughs> so we're very, very like anal about where we use sanitizers and how we use sanitizers. You know, just because you sanitize a piece of fish doesn't mean it'll age. You're essentially killing it. All right. The same goes for water. This is why all your ice machines may have mold because you run a filter through your ice machine. It removes that chlorine that is the immunity of water. All right. So. Has anyone not had any sample of fish? Okay. Ooh. All right. All right. Coming over. And how does the health department monitor the dry aging or dry ager, dry aging process? Uh, we, get, we get inspected all the time. Our dates are, are always in order. Our dates are always within, within spec. And at the end of the day, nothing smells. Nothing's rotting. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, that's all they really care about. Yeah. Right. And another question from the app. How do you control the humidity in the dry ager? So the, specifically these dry agers, what they do is there's a uh, function where it will collect the water during the defrost cycles, and then they'll use that water to vaporize back into the system when it needs to. So when you set a humidity level, it's gonna track up and down, and as it needs, it's gonna put moisture back into the atmosphere or take it out, right. or take it out. And it has a lot to do with your ambient temperatures as well, right, ambient conditions. Every time you open the door, you're bringing that humidity back up to 100%. Great. Any other audience questions? Is there, is there a reason you wouldn't dry cure, uh, like cure this after the fact, now that you've done this process? Any reason you wouldn't? Would it no. You, you could still cure it, um, but you will have to adjust your amounts because what, what is your function of curing? It's to pull all that moisture out in the cure process, right? So you have less moisture, so when you do cure it, you have to adjust for that. What's the temperature again in the dry aging machine, the dry aging fridge? So we like to um, accomplish or we try to achieve a 0 0.8 degrees Celsius flatline average, right? The, the temperature never stays static in there, right? It's always going up or coming down. So you kind of want to log and monitor to see what your temperature is over time. What, what is the average temperature your product is experiencing over 14 days? The more stable, the tighter, that parameter is, the better it is. It's easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. How often do you find yourself cleaning the inside of the, the dry ager itself? Man, I have a team that is on that. Uh, we have 36 doors worth of dry aging capacity over there, and something's always being cleaned. So um, it's, you know, again, cleaning, you have to understand where and how to use sanitizers. Right, so that's a very big component of 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 what we do, and um, everything has to stay pretty pretty darn clean. And do you use the cleaner that dry ager that they like? When I bought one, they sent me cleaner to clean it. Do you use that, or do you? Uh, I actually personally never use that product. You know, we use Quatamine, so at the end of the day, that's that's what we use. But like I said. Um, be very cautious where you use it and how we, we have specific people that's only allowed to use it to disinfect the, 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 the dry agers. And you know, once you, once you disinfect it, you gotta make sure you burp that system, 
dry it out. It's got to be sterile for the next load. Yeah. Okay, we have about one to two more minutes. Any final Perfect. questions from the audience? I had posted my question on the app, but I'll just say it myself. I wanted to ask about smoking and how it incorporates with this technique um, as far as before the, the, the process, after the process, can you incorporate at every stage? Uh, how does smoking pair with it as far as like uh, using smoking techniques for the fish? So smoke, smoke is a form of preservative, right? You're essentially, so um, we, we don't use smoke, but you can smoke the product afterwards, okay. right? I'm trying to keep the product neutral um, so you can smoke it and you utilize it in, 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 in that preparation. And you wouldn't smoke it before? No. Right? It, wouldn't, it, would, it would be not beneficial? It would not be beneficial. Um, unless you, you want to have smoked fish. Right. Because once you incorporate smoke, now you're limited to what you can do with it because it's smoked fish. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to take our final question. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, you were saying to use weight loss percentage as a measure for like readiness if you were to try and do it on your own. Correct. I was wondering if you had like an ideal weight loss percentage or if it would vary by fish, I'm sure, by species, but like are you looking for like a 20% loss like, or do you just sort of taste it and see how, you, see how it tastes? Uh, you know, I think there's one rule of thumb. You don't want to go beyond 25 because then it does get too dry. Like after 25, the fish is cryptic. It's, you know... Uh, it's ready for Halloween, but it, 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 it like ten, I think 10%, 15%, no more than 20, depending on your species. Uh, play around with it and then go from there. You know, like salmon, it's a high fat fish, low moisture, so you might only get 10%, 12% out of a salmon, right? But a, a bream, you might want 15%. So it really depends on what you want. It's all about trial and error and collecting those data points. Okay. Leeway, thank you so much for being here and You're sharing welcome. all this. <laughs>